afternoon. Welcome to Primal Sports Talk. I'm your host Dale Parham and I'm alongside me is the show. Ken Watson. Watson. <laughs> Back again this week. Another show from 1 to 2 Primal Sports Center. Today we have? Well, today's lineup we have a very special lady yeah. waiting. You know, she's a, she's a five-time Olympian, but but some of the record says that she's four. Well, I guess, she, then, well, I guess she, we'll she, clear that up to yeah, you. We'll have clarification on that. And um, at the halfway mark, we'll have Daniel Dowie doing our commentary. And at the end section, we have our open our open mic section right. where we discuss the reviews um, from over the last past, week. Over and, last week. Yeah, and we remember the primary calling number is one eight seven six five five two. 7407. Feel free to call in on WhatsApp. Feel free to call in. I guess after we speak to our guest speaker this week, um, around 1 30 to I guess 1 45, callings will be open. Yes, they'll take it away. Yeah, let, 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 let me introduce this special lady now. Yeah, uh, she's a, a, a five or four time Olympian. Well, I remember her from, from 1992. She was my favorite athlete, a matter of fact, you know. Well, that, that 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 race that hundred and that two hundred race there. Well, so, I was I was too young back then to remember that. But you know, most people nowadays <laughs> know her as an MP. That, that, that but race, that we now here are talking about there. sports, so, and I was yeah. I was too young back then. Bridge the generation gap. We want her to break down her career, because to me she's one of the legends, one of the icons of sport. Her name Bridge the generation gap. We want her to her career was before my time. I want to get in to see how it was more to get a feel of if I was around at that time of what took place and how it was like and how different it is today from then and yeah. all the accolades I mean going to five Olympics I don't I can't think of anybody worse and she's the first lady to first Olympian you know to, 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 to medal to, no not to medal to make it to garden house Oh well, I mean, <laughs> welcome. Yeah, welcome. Are oh, no, we all talking? <laughs> she break it down for us right now. I mean, welcome to Sp Prime and Sports Talk, Gillette. Hi, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Yes, I want you to clear it up for me. Were you a five-time or a four-time Olympian? Well, I went to five Olympic Games. I competed in four. In, uh, in in four. No, you're a five I, I, my player. first my first Olympics was in 1980. Uh, I was 16 years old and I went as an alternate for the relay. So I went I, I went and had fun. <laughs> in Moscow. <laughs> after, that, after that, all the fun and games was over because I got a taste of what the Olympics was all about. Uh, because at 16, I didn't have a clue. Um, a little country girl didn't understand what the Olympics was was about or that something like as big as that an event like that existed i i just knew about karifta games and champs okay. and so after going to the olympics in 1980 in moscow i go wow there's something bigger than champs yeah. uh and so my eyes were then set to make the next olympic team and definitely i, I did that in 1984 and competed there until my last olympics in 1996. So yes, five-time Olympian, competed in four. Okay, okay, good, good, good. But I mean, that experience in the 1980 Olympics must have been, as I said, an eye-opener, just to even be there and not compete, but to be there to see what it's like, that must have been a great experience. It was, and I have to say that of all the Olympic Games for the opening ceremony, I remember that one the most, that left the best impression on me as to what the sport was about and seeing all the athletes in the village and watching the competition from afar um, in the stands or at the Olympic village, watching on TV to see the athletes perform and then seeing them win medals and then coming back to the village and passing them in the cafeteria or on the bus 
Um, it was an incredible experience for me as a youngster and um, wanted to definitely get to where they were at the time. Um, my, my roommate at the time was actually Merlin Otti. Oh, and she got a bronze medal. So that was exciting for me to have a, an Olympian medalist coming back and being my roommate. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it was, it was really an experience, um, a great experience for me and mind blowing. Um, you know, the Russians, they went all out when it came to the opening ceremony and closing ceremony. And it was just, it was just fantastic. And, you know, by the way, I don't remember any other mascot's name. Yeah. None. Of all the Olympics that I went to, yeah. none of them, I don't remember their names or what they look like. I remember one, I think maybe 90s, it was like a bird looking thing. Yeah. Um, but the mascot in 1980, the name, um, it was Mishka, the bear. Yeah. Um, and I remember that. Yeah. Oh, oh, Jeanette, tell me something. Um, Merlin was was kind of standoffish. I've never even heard an interview really with Merlin. Tell me what you, what was Merlin like? You know, I, I always want to know what was it's Merlin just, like. Sure. People would say you're standoffish because you don't chat as much as I chat. Um, I'm very outgoing. I'm an extrovert, and I would say Merlin was more of an introvert. Um, I you know I I have to be seen wherever I am. <laughs> she was more on the quiet side and wanted, preferred spending time, most times by herself in her little space. Um, but she was very friendly. If you strike up a conversation with Merlin at any point in time, she wouldn't, you know, have her hands like this. She would definitely engage you. But she was not the one to really start a conversation where me, I would start a conversation with just any, anybody. Um, so I wouldn't say she was standoffish. I think a lot of people didn't understand her um, or don't understand her. She was just a quiet being. Okay. okay. I mean, at age 16, um, going to the Olympics, that means you must have been fasting. You, you'd been in well, high school. You know, what was it know, like in fun, high school? Funny enough, I mean, I guess I was. I don't know. You know, um, I, I got... It was funny because Merlin got fifth in that Olympic trials. If you go back and look, yeah. she was in the top three, you know, yeah. she got fifth, she got fifth and I got sixth. Yeah. And so she was really not supposed to compete in the Olympic games. Um, but while we're on the circuit going to the Olympics before, you know, they had these meets and I think she was, she then beat, um, you know, Jackie Pusey or the rest of the girls that yeah. were supposed to take part in the race. And that's how she went on the team as the per the top three. And uh, so again, as I said, I think I ran, I'm not even sure what time I ran at that time. Mm -hmm. um, 1980, probably maybe it was 11, five or something like that mm -hmm. as a high schooler yeah. um, that I, that I ran, but it wasn't a superb time, but I think I was, that was fast enough for a yeah. 16 year old. Yeah, you were in the top six, as I said, no matter the times, because people get misguided with time. Just poor with time these days. I mean, if you win the race in 11-5 versus running 10-8 and getting bronze, I'm sure you'd take winning in 11-5 because you have to And remember, 1980, there. people were winning like with 11 zero, zero. Yeah, <laughs> different so, times. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So, so I would add up the feedback in the background. Also, tell us, tell us about your days at Morant Bay. My days at Morant Bay High was great. Um, my, um, that's where my career took off. Um, Howard Jackson was the man who, uh, who found Juliet Cuthbert um, and got me to go to Morant Bay High. I'm glad I went. There were other schools, of, of course, looking at me, but I was not interested in going anywhere out of um, St. Thomas. Um, Veer was very hot at the time. But I didn't like the Veer girls. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it was a great experience. We had a really good team, Marcia Brown. Um, we had a really good team, um, you know, at the time and good camaraderie, good connection. And I had a wonderful coach who was a visionary. Um, and he's the one who actually got me to go to the Olympic trials and said, you have to go to the Olympic trials. Yeah, even though I didn't want to, but mm -hmm. he understood and he understood the, the, the sport mm -hmm. and knew that and saw the talent in me that I, that I did not recognize even at that early age. So very, very happy that I went to that school and under his tutelage. 
Yeah. How, how about Chams? Uh, uh, in, in Chams, um, Chams was exciting. Any medals Don't let Chams get excited. My biggest rival was a girl by the name of Winsome Darby. Funny enough, I was at my constituency office on Thursday, and she called me. Um, and this is my rival from high school, Winsome Darby. Um, we didn't like each other too much, a veer girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, at the time, but she gave me good competition, and, you know, we were at it. And... Um, it was fun. I, boy, champs, you know, of course, with girls, we, we, at the time, we had boys and girls champs, and nobody really came and watched us. Yeah. So I'm really glad when they merged the two together yeah. to make sure that we had more spectators coming out to watch um, the great talents of, of, of the women that we have in Jamaica. But champs is exciting for me and, a, and great, fantastic memories, fantastic memories. All the cheering and the, uh, the songs you sang and the beating of the drums and Sounds you, like you remember oh, Chums great, no, the hairstyles. Yeah. Hair yeah. I used to have my hair up in one and put the the, the rubber band with a thing straight yeah. up. Oh, and yeah. then the long socks. It was just exciting, you know? Mm. Sounds like you remember Chums more than Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know yeah. Yeah. Chums is a great experience. Um, Great so experience. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world for mm. high school. Um, the 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 kind of um, you know emphasis that we place on champs in Jamaica yeah. is almost like the same emphasis that other countries play when it comes to their big international needs. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, champs especially now you have boys and girls champs and the competition. The competition now is just yeah. incredible. But you went to a high school in America, right? I went to Olney High in Philadelphia. My parents, my family lives in Philadelphia. And um, I went to Olney High, a no-name school. They didn't, I was the biggest thing that ever walked through that door in track and field. Um, when I got there and I told them that at the time I had gone to the Olympics that summer, migrated that fall and started school that January. And of course, it was no big deal for me because, you know, we're Jamaicans and champs yeah. is a big thing. Yeah. So when I said to the coach, I just came back from the Olympics, he's like, of course, nobody believed you. So they're like, OK, we want to see you run 100 meter and see how yeah. fast you really are. Yeah. And they put me out there and I blew them away. Whoever they, I don't remember who was in the race. And I mean, I'm not warming up or anything. And I think I ran maybe like an 11 three. No. or something like that um not on a very good track either and he, they were like wow so um but all the high school was not a big school on track and field so my days at pen relays was not that great with the school um, okay but then if it was nowadays you'd probably tell him to just google me and it, <laughs> exactly. it's different yeah i said right. check me out on youtube but <laughs> I guess it's different back then. So you had Google to, my name. Yes, Google me. <laughs> you had to just go on the track and run and prove yourself. So, right. I mean, so fast track, no, I guess 92 Olympics probably your most memorable scene. That's when you got the medals. Tell us about that experience. Well, it was a great experience. I mean, you know, 1984, I made it to the semifinals in the 100 meters. Um, I just, and it was an incredible experience for me after going to 1980, just going there to watch. So my net, my goal was to get to the 1984 Olympics. And then you had Valerie Briscoe, Hooks, Merlin, Hotty, you know, Evelyn Ashford. I mean, these are like stars, you know, yeah. Flo Joe, all these girls are lined up and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. um, what am I doing here? Uh, and they were ahead of me in college, of course. I went to University of Texas at Austin, and they were, I watched these girls compete. And so it was exciting for me because I was just having fun. There was no pressure on me at all going to the 1984 Olympics. I was just out there having a blast. And I had actually had had a brain tumor, and I had surgery that December before the Olympics, which was about six, seven months before the Olympics. And so I was just happy to be there and to make it to the semifinals. Um, then, of course, 1988, I made another team, and I made it to the finals of the 100. And then, of course, you set your goals. And I said, you know what? I need to make it to the finals and medal in the next yeah. Olympics. And I actually made it to the finals and end up meddling. 
But the funny thing about it is I was going through a lot of, you know, things, personal things in my life at the time. And Merlene had given me, saw what I was going through and said, boy, if you could run and be top seven in the world with all the things that was happening to you, Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you my workout because if there's anybody I know that can beat me is you. Mm-hmm. And she had started sending me a workout. But at that time, we had fax machine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so she used to fax my workout to me. And I would look at it and, um, you know, do my workout, time myself, coach myself. And um, I ended up beating her, you know. And we still, we had that good relationship where it didn't really matter. If anybody yeah. was going to beat her, she would have rather me beating yeah. her, of course. And so 1992, I went there as nobody was looking at me. Because if you look back at the tape, everybody in the rounds, they were looking at Gail Devers, they were looking at Gwen Torrance, they were looking at Merlin and Irina Provolivo. Mm -hmm. Juliet was kind of in the background. But listen, though, the one person, you know, that said, um, watch out for Juliet Cuthbert was one person. Remember that Bronco driving (laughs) in L.A.? Yeah, yeah. Bronco. Bronco. The Bron- Bronco. Oh, 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 oh. The football oh, player. OJ. OJ Simpson. Simpson. OJ was Simpson. one of the comments. Yes. Yeah. OJ oh, Simpson yeah, yeah. was the only person that said, watch out for Juliet Cuthbert. Yeah, yeah. And because yeah. uh, nobody was really having eyes for me. And but I knew what kind of shape I was in, I think, mm-hmm. because I was in a training camp. And again, as I said, I was coaching myself, but I, one day I got Merlin's coach to watch me and time me. And he walked over to me and he showed me the time and he said, oh my God, mm-hmm. he goes, you can win the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And coming from him, I was like, if him said me can win the Olympics, yeah, me definitely my, can win the Olympics. Yeah, go, go and so I think when he showed me the time and I, and, um, you know, felt the way I felt, I said, boy, I can really do this. Um, so I didn't doubt myself going into the Olympic games. Um, I think everybody else doubted what I could do, but I never doubted myself. And I, again, I, in every race, I go out there to have fun, yeah. you know, um, track and field was just a fun thing for me. Um, and I enjoyed it, but it was a wonderful experience winning, um, winning the hundred meter and then coming back and winning the 200 meter, getting, Two Olympic silver medals was just an awesome feeling. So after the hundred, going into two hundred, how did you feel? I mean, oh, invincible. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, yeah. because because the the two hundred meter is my better event. Yeah. yeah so yeah. where you would get nervous for the hundred meter, there was never any nerves for me in yeah. a two hundred. It was more like yes, this is my this is my event, this yeah. is my race. Um. And so it was, it was just, again, another fun thing for me. I knew I was a good curve runner. And so I knew if I executed on the curve very well, um, I had that 200 meter, you know, strength that mm-hmm. I could hang on. I was really trying to beat um, Gwen Torrance. Yeah. <laughs> You know, she talked yeah, a lot. She she talked, talked yeah, a lot. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. And so, but it didn't happen. We, you know, we ran very fast in the semifinal. And Merlin was like, what the heck is wrong with you running 21, 7? And I said, you know, Merlin, I didn't know I was going that fast. Because yeah. when you look at the race, Gwen and I both slowed down. Yeah. We backed yeah. off. I knew I backed off. I was not all out when I ran the 21.75. Yeah. I was not all out. Um, yeah. But of course, you know, lactic acid getting your legs. So by then, and it wasn't like, um, no, where these athletes they get a entire like day rest. Yeah, you yeah. know, they get a break between the rounds. And I'm like, I wish I had that. Yeah. We went, you know, from heats to, we, we were running yeah. every day back back, in the yeah. moment and then coming back. Yes. Different children. So, yeah. So I didn't have that. We didn't have that kind of a break, but, um, it was it was just exciting to look at the time and saw twenty one seventy five and I was just like I mean never that run fast yeah ease of ease of guess it exactly yeah. but of course in the final didn't run as fast I think my final was twenty two zero and yeah, yeah. also Gwen Gwen was about twenty one eighty nine or ninety yeah. something so um, but it was it was it was fun it was great fun great fun. Yeah. 
So I guess I, was Merlin in your roommate then when you went back with the silver medal? No, no, by this time now we're big time, you know, so you have your oh. own room. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I can yeah. tell you that was that was my first watching my first Olympics 92. Uh-huh. And you became my favorite female runner. Mm. Thank and, you. Yes, <laughs> man. I tell you, and, and it's when Gelly was beating the finals, the whole house was cussing about our America teeth. You know what talk already. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't look back on the race and say she probably yeah. did win the race. Yeah. You know, but yeah, man. I, I yeah. knew it was close, yeah. um, but I didn't think I'd gotten her at the line fast enough. Yeah. Um, so it was just us, Merlin and I were hugging and waiting just to see. Um, what you know, what place or where we were, but um, it was it was it was great. But I mean, you know, the only thing I regret about that, you know, now these girls and get them flag and them run around the track, yeah. never get no flag and <laughs> be able to take no victory lap with my for my silver medal. Yeah. So, you know, we have just we've evolved so yeah. um, much, and I'm very grateful for the girls now and the boys, um, mm-hmm. to see them. Um, getting the accolades and being able to be recognized um, the way they are and making the money that they're making and the endorsement deals because back then nobody was really looking at us no matter how fast we were mm-hmm. we could not we could hardly get a contract because yeah. we were Jamaicans yeah. where and Nike would look at somebody else I remember I'll never forget Nike after this is leading up to the Olympic Games and I was running very fast and they were about to give me a contract and then they took it back wow. and then they gave it, I heard that they gave it to another, to some guy. Um, and it was sad because I was running fast, um, as fast as a Gwen Torrance, as fast as, uh, no, the other girls in the U S but I, they had a contract and I could not get a contract. And so for me now, it's like, yes, you know, looking at our girls now and the fact that they're coming out of high school and gaining, um, contract, I'm just really pleased how the sport has evolved. Yeah, but but you are integral in um, helping Usain as well. Um, um, well, I tell you what, when I moved back to Jamaica and I started working at Western Sports as a marketing manager, I was we're ma- I was managing we're managing a team, Arnett Gardens Football Club, and you know, I was just like, Miss, Mr. Chang is um, you know the owner of Western Sports here, and I was like, you know, what's this with all this football, football, football? Track and field is a big track and field country. Yeah. And I said, we need a track athlete. Um, and so we decided to sign Usain, just, of course, understanding the market, <clears throat> knowing that we couldn't give him for money if he was going to go to college. Um, so we wanted to preserve that. And so I said, look, we need to sign Usain um, and sign him with Puma, because Puma was a predominant, um, you know, um, yeah. clothing mm-hmm. gear that, Western sports was actually doing at the time. And I said, let's sign him. So we signed him for a clothing deal. And it was, mm-hmm. of course, you know, in Trelawney at the time. So Montego Bay was where he would pick up his stuff. And that is how, and then we also gave, um, for, um, food and clothing. So food and clothing, we were able to do that where is, um, you know, he was taken care of in that respect where he was able to eat properly. And so we did that deal. Um, I, you know, I made that possible with, of course, with the owner of Western Sports. And then I got wind that um, he was going to go pro, that he was not going to go um, to college, that he was going to go pro. So, you know, I pick up the phone right away. I may call up the Puma International. Um, I call up and I said, hey, guess what? Usain is going to go pro. He's been with Puma. He's been with us. We've been taking good care of him. You need to fly down from Germany right now because I hear Nike's showing him big money. You need yeah. to go down there right now and take care of this. And yeah. they wasted no time. Yeah. They flew into Jamaica that same week and started a conversation. And it's because he was already with Puma, with Western Sports, um, that and the relationship that he had with Mr. Chang at Western Sports that he was able to then, I think it was an easy choice. And when you're loyal, or somebody's been loyal to you, it was an easy choice, yeah. I think, at the time for him to then say, fine, I'm going to sign with Puma. And here he is, still with Puma. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so transitioning from, I guess, your track career, you went into like marketing and being a sports agent in somewhat of an aspect. 
I mean, for not you. really. That was the <laughs> only thing. I didn't want to start traveling again because mm-hmm. I saw what that did with me and my son. I mean, I had to leave him and, mm-hmm. you know, and then the, the, the whole, even though he was no older, I just kind of wanted to, and I, and I hate flying. I hate flying. <laughs> so being a sports manager, it means I would have to travel again mm-hmm. and fly all over the place. I, mean, I couldn't bother with that. Mm-hmm. So I decided I'm going to open my own gym. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is what I did. So immediately after that, I started my own gym business in 2005. I opened my first gym and um, I did that up, up until 2018 when I closed the doors um, of my gym and I'm, and went into something else. I'm just, I, want, I, I want to go back to 92 for a minute because I was, I was crying, you know, I was crying and, and that back stretch, the back stretch. Remember the really? Oh yeah, I cried too. Oh my. <laughs> no, um, what was it a hamstring? Was it a hamstring or it was yeah, very bad? I, I know. Funny enough, that leg still bothers me. I think I I did something to the nerve also because okay. my leg now, it still bothers me. Um, you know, trust me, it was a bad injury and it took me an entire year to actually come back. You see, like the injury with Yohan Blake? Yes. It was something similar to that, I believe. And, um, you know, it, it, it was devastating because... Yeah. I felt my leg. It's almost like you're running. And let me tell you, I was running that back stretch. No, I was me. running. I'm moving. I was <laughs> running. And because, you know, Evelyn Nashville was on the back stretch. And I said, there's no way me go, me, you're not come yeah. close to me. Never yeah. run left you today. We yeah. were the favorites, right? Listen, of course, we were the favorites. Yeah. How old one year was born? Let me tell you, I just felt my leg do this. Yeah, I know that. I just you. felt like a separation. And mm-hmm. so my leg just got mm-hmm. very elastic. And I said, if I have to hop on one leg, I pass on this baton today. Mm-hmm. And I kept hopping and hopping. But what happened, I think they scared uh, my teammates. And because uh, everybody kept saying, Juliet, I got run up on you. Juliet, I got run up on you. Because by this time, you remember, I got so fast. You know, <laughs> yes, I was running yes. so fast. Mm-hmm. And she it's took off. off before she took off before the um, the mark. Mm-hmm. And I could she couldn't win them in the moment with this crowd screaming and you she couldn't hear me saying wait wait and I was limping on one leg trying to pass on the baton so she could get that and go give to Merlin and it just never happened. Mm-hmm. I mean it was a that would have been a world record. No, yes, the shape. Um, Michelle Freeman, Michelle yeah. Freeman ran an awesome first leg, mm-hmm. awesome yeah. first leg to give me that a decent lead, awesome first leg. And so I think with myself and Merlene, I think we would have definitely have gotten the world record at the time. Yeah. But it wasn't meant to be. It was one of those things. Oh, so you didn't you didn't really recover after that injury then? I never recovered after that injury. The yeah. following year was very trying for me, trying to get my leg my leg better. Um, I didn't make a lot of money even after the fact because I ran in the Olympics without a contract. I was on like a, what do you call it? Like a retainer kind of a thing. And yeah. then they didn't sign me after because you're now injured and they wanted to see what happened. So I didn't make any major money. You know, after the anyway, after this Olympics and after the whoever win the gold, silver, bronze, and your money goes up. Yeah. So the five or six or seven meets you have after that, you're going to be now worth way more than what you went into the Olympics with. And so I was able to run about three or four meets after the Olympics, limping basically and making good money, making good money. Cause they were paying me like $25,000 or $20,000 for the race, even though, um, you know, they knew I was hurt. Um, but then the following year, I wasn't able to really capitalize because the injury was still plaguing me somewhat. Okay. So, uh, before we wrap up, Jay, because, you know, we're pressed for time. What's your take on this year's 200 meter Olympics female? It's going to be, I can't wait. I yeah. cannot wait. To me, that is even the championship. So. Because you have the USA in it running 21-6. You have our Jamaicans running 21, two of our girls running. Yeah. Elaine hasn't really, Elaine, I think, will get there. She ran yeah. 22 yeah. for the other day, but I think Elaine will be able to do it. Yeah. 
So when you look at Sharika running 21 seconds, PR and a big, big, big PR for her. And then you have, um, you know, our own Shelly and Fraser Price running a shocker for me. Cause I didn't, I wasn't, I was expecting maybe like a 21, eight, nine. Yeah. Yeah. So she's there in the mix. Millie, Miller, Weibo. Miller, Uber Weibo, from, yeah. from, Miller, Bahamas. Weibo from, from Bahamas. Yeah. It's going to be good. It's going to be off the chain. So but I think the spot two, no, one, two, three. <laughs> but I think the I think the two that I'm going to watch is Miller Weibo and of course watch Sharika. Yeah. Sharika, Sharika has Sharika has that 400 meter strength. And yeah. if she learns, if she runs the curve as she ran the curve the other day a few days a few a week ago, mm-hmm. if she learned to run the curve better, it's going to be on. Mm-hmm. It's going to be on. I think she'll be able to PR again um, and run probably like a 21 six, but I think possibly for body, they get their rest. Yeah. I think um, we're going to see 21 six for that 200 meter six. final. Uh, yeah. I think we're going to see 21 six for the 200 meter finals. All right. Well, Jeanette, uh, thank you. Let me jump in a second. Um, my producer. Hi, teacher. We made a couple of jokes together. Yeah, you, you, know, you know, I couldn't stay here. I'd not even jump in and say hi. So, Juliet, thanks for doing this. And I'm from Primal, you know. Thanks for doing this for the team. Thank you. No problem. Hope to have you again. Nah, uh, say again. <laughs> Anything for you. Oh, <laughs> that's what I mean. Yeah. So, we have, we have you back on the show again later on. All right, thank you. Oh, sure. Anytime. All right. Thank, thank you, Juliet. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right, now, so it's time for sports commentary with co-host Daniel Dowie. What's up today, Daniel? Hi, guys. How are you? Good. We're good. good. <laughs> Why are you run off Juliet so early? I was enjoying it. Oh, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> she even back for sure, though. Plus, I tell you. It was so much fun watching her talk about the younger athletes and who's doing it now. And her commentary on the 200, I was able to catch that. So it's really, really Good to hear that last bit of Gillette Cuthbert. So, guys, so today I'm talking about the Omar McLeod issue. Um, it's kind of died down after the trials, but it was rekindled this week because, again, we had the Gateshead Diamond League on, the was it Tuesday or Wednesday? And Omar McLeod went to a press conference at the Diamond League, and he... He threw the J3A, which they're not unfamiliar with, under the bus. And he made a couple of comments that really got a lot of coaches and athletes and fans and people associated with the sport really talking about it. So if uh, for those of you who are not familiar, at the national trials, Omar McLeod, first of all, he's our reigning Olympic champion in the 110-meter hurdles. He came into the national trials number one in the world, but he finished eighth in the finals. In the semifinals, he actually ran a world leading time, um, or his second fastest time, I think, for the year, 13.04. And then in the final, he comes, hits the first hurdle, and finishes eighth. So there's been ongoing debate about whether or not he should be sent to Tokyo. Um, The J3A should select him. He submitted a medical exemption after... He ran the race. And so I want to just touch on the fact that I think the J3A made the right decision. Um, since, the, since the issue, Omar McLeod has gone on social media to explain what's happened. And basically, he's upset about the schedule change. Normally, the 110 hurdles, the final and semifinal is run on the same day. That has changed. The semifinal is run the night before. And they came to the stadium from 5 a.m. to run at 8.30 final. So there's a big change in schedule, which was due to the curfew, of course. And we almost didn't even have a trials in the first place. And, you know, the JPA had to have ongoing discussions to even make it happen. But for in terms of Omar McLeod, um, he said a lot of stuff, but I just want to set the record straight in terms of whether or not the JPA made the right decision and leaving him out of the team. 
I think that they did make the right decision. Um, they have a selection policy that prioritizes the top three places in each event to go. And the key thing here is that the medical exemption. So the medical exemption is typically submitted to exempt you to prevent to um, exempt you from running your competing. You have a medical you have an injury. Sorry, you have an injury, and you say, "Hey, I don't think I can run um, at the trials. Please consider me. I'm going to prove fitness." And they tell you by when to prove fitness. So what happened in Omar's Omar McLeod's case is that he felt severe cramps before the race. But what happened, he said he called somebody and he still ran the race. So once you get out there on the track, you're going to be judged by your performance. So just think of it this way. Any athlete run a race and then they turn around and say, I didn't feel good. That's why I didn't perform well. But I need to go to Tokyo. I need to still get the medal. Yeah. It, it just doesn't make any sense. So in terms of the medical exemption, he didn't follow the procedure and he actually ran the race. So it's, it's hard for the J3A. They, they, there's no way they could consider him, in, um, this, especially when the fact that he actually ran the race. So he made reference to Usain Bolt. In 2016, Usain Bolt received a medical exemption from the J3A, but Usain didn't run the race. So he competed in the 100 meter at the trials and he ran the first round, felt his hamstring, Second round, it got worse, and he pulled out of the meet. And I think that year, Elaine Thompson and Janine Russell were also granted medical exemption. So it has worked for other athletes, but they and their management followed the procedure, which is to submit it before the event, and then the athlete would not run. So Omar McLeod made two mistakes. He submitted it. First, he ran the race. Big mistake. And the second one, he submitted the medical exemption after the race. So it looks like, hey, I just had a bad day, but I need to go on the fastest man, so you have to take me. Mm. So it, it really doesn't um, go well for him. And so in terms of the selection policy, J3A, they adhere to the policy. That's fair. He was calling for fairness um, in his comments against. He said he didn't have a fair opportunity. Everybody in his event were subject to the same um, circumstances. Uh, the same selection policy, it has been this way for a long time. The medical exemption policy has been used for Usain Bolt and other athletes, so he can't say that's preferential treatment. And, you know, when I hear him speak, it sounds like he has not accepted the results and that he needs people in his circle who is going to say, hey, look, you're wrong this time, you need to accept it. Um, what I would like to see personally from Omar McLeod is that he refocuses, pulls a Kendra Harrison, go break the world record, do something fancy. Mm. Um, instead, he sounds like he is entitled. He sounds like he's just making excuses. And it's a, it's yeah. a bad look. It's a bad look. And I want him to accept the results and take responsibility for his role. Um, you know, Advanced preparation could have saved some of the issues that he mentioned in his Twitter rant. And uh, I'm going to say just those are my takeaways. The selection mm -hmm. policy, um, medical exemption policy, it's it's mm -hmm. workable. It's been working. The JPA made the right decision. And where Omar McLeod is concerned, he just needs to man up and accept yeah, responsibility. I, I, I totally around. agree with you, Daniel, on that take. Um, yeah, he's in the wrong. Yeah. Th thanks, <laughs> for, thanks for that take, Daniel, because we're, we're, we're totally agreeing. We're both here in the studio. <laughs> and, I mean, that will be taken away from somebody who will get a chance to compete, made the Olympic qualifying time, and perform at the trials, and everybody under the same circumstances. Yes, he's our so-called best chance of meddling, but yeah. I mean, we have to make way for athletes that also can do as well and made a great. So yeah, man, Omar is definitely for, well. I wanted Omar to run, but under yeah. under the circumstances, I, I I would not allow him to run. And even it so, be, he, he be ran so, that race. Yeah, he would be, and leave him, beat him in the race. So yeah. But he's a big yeah, time so runner. That's, that's, that's a big, big thing as well yeah, because yeah. everybody affects his performance. Yeah, yeah, he drew a lot of attention to himself. And mm -hmm. 
you know, in the past, he has fumbled in the hurdles even. So people, mm -hmm. you know how people say you perform badly. They're like, oh, mental training. Um, you need to see a sports mm -hmm. psychologist. So they, they're watching him. Some people feel that he's choked several times before. And mm -hmm. so for him to be in this emotional state, which is understandable, mm -hmm. goes and performs badly, it's, it doesn't... I, I, well for your campaign think, to go to the games. I think, that is, un, I think that is unfair though, you know, for, for people to say he's not a choker. Mm -hmm. I don't think Omar is a choker. I know we know how. But the best way to respond to all these critics is to perform on a track. Give yeah. us some big performances, as you said. Yeah. So yes, go I there, run 12-8. Yeah, he can eight. recoup. And yeah. I think he is in really good shape. Like the yeah. semi-final race when he jogged, he literally jogged 13.04 seconds. And yeah. that's really impressive. Yeah. So I'm expecting him to stop complaining, refocus, and go break the world record and, yeah. you know, do something crazy. I think he's yeah. extremely capable of doing that. And that's what I would like to see him do rather than, you know, at this point, crying over spilled milk. And the best, <laughs> and he, I believe yeah. he's, he's entered as a reserve. I'm not sure um, if he's possible. entered as a reserve. It, yeah, it, it's possible. Possibly. Yeah. But um, tip. Typically, we like to, um, well, not we, but sometimes the JFA gets the, the brunt of um, bad decisions. And I think this one, it, they, they made the right decision. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, see now, Preston's time is staying with us for the rest of the take because we had a lot of hot takes from last week. Because, I mean, last week we spoke about football, and I'm sure a lot of the people that call in wanted to know our responses. They had spoke about tennis as well. So... I mean, I don't. You watch other sports as well, then? No, but uh, I, where football is, uh, <laughs> well, I watch football during the World Cup, But but I'm looking for different things. Uh, um, you know, I I just root for cute players. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's, that's just how it works. Well, we we can understand. We can understand. All right, the phone the phone lines are now open, and the calling number is eight seven six five five two seven four zero seven via WhatsApp. That's eight seven six. Five five two seven four zero seven. All right, we have to talk about England. That horrible <laughs> performance by the coach of England, not the players. Oh, I, I, the I like that you said coach. I saw yeah, that the commentary coach. on that. <laughs> yes, and two things on that: the commentary um, on the coach uh, putting players who were on the bench yeah. um, to go take out a penalty, which is a very you know it requires yeah, it's, it's, to be calm and in the game. And they're on That's the bench touchy. watching this nail biting game, and then come off the bench and, and just to kick a penalty. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but I, doubt, I doubt if I doubt if Saka kick a ball since him going on the pitch. Yeah. The first kick that nineteen year old would have made is when it, 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 to spot the ball to kick the penalty. Uh, yeah. It's a yeah. poor decision. It seems like setting them up for failure. Of course, I have a different take on that You're because Italian, but uh, and I'm plus I'm biased. <laughs> I Italy is my side. I'm not complaining, <laughs> oh. but. I would think that a lot has happened in the training ground that he would seem fit that these are the five best players performing in training to take the penalties. Under pressure situations, it's different. I mean, putting a 19-year-old there in that situation is tough, but I mean, he's a professional. Stepped up, Mr. Penalty, but also other players, Mr. Italy as well. So to me, penalty kicks... It's kind of a lottery. No, talk about talk about the flow of the game now. But first of all, I want to say talk about I got my team. picks. I got my picks right though. Yeah. Because last yes. week I said yes. Argentina. Peter. <laughs> so I got my picks right. What about the flow of the game? You score early goal and then you start to defend. That, but that's with, how, with, with eighty-seven minutes to go in the football game. But I mean, that's how England basically play most of the tournament. Oh He's a defensive set mind coach, yep. and I mean, they want to soak up the pressure and. He just went to penalty kicks, but when I'm you, not complaining. Italy won, Italy won. When you want championships in it, you have to go for it, you know. Yeah. You can't, you, you deserve to lose at that finals, man. And then Messi, Messi won. Oh, no. Well, Argentina won, but Messi, yeah. the player of the tournament, I mean, five goals for us is getting that burden off his shoulder. Argentina winning. The first Copa. international title for Messi. Yeah, in about... 20 plus years, so no, the first international title for yeah. Messi, yeah. But well, I mean, Argentina, no longer a club baller. Uh, I've never deemed it as a club <laughs> baller, but I mean, yeah, performances are different. Daniel, what's your opinion, Daniel? What's your view on Messi? 
<laughs> and Messi. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm a Neymar fan, and uh -huh. um, really, guys, I, I I really have to say that I I really I really just root for cute players. So I, I, <laughs> I, I know I know how good it sounds, but yeah, well, yeah, no, right, no, no, that's no, why no, Neymar no. is my favorite. <laughs> And um, I, I don't yes, find so. Messi attractive, so. <laughs> but I did want to, to to ask you guys what you thought about. Um, there was a Luke feature of Usain Bolt saying that he was shocked at the racism response um, towards the players. I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked. It's all. It's all well, maybe, maybe it's not highlighted, but it's it's been going on for years. Yeah, years. I mean these countries. I, mean, I know that's why I'm asked. Why do you think, uh, what you think about him being shocked? No, 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 there's no way I'm uh, shocked. You say should, both should know better. I mean, I, of course, both know better. I think both travel the world. Funny. I mean, probably just saying that say in this day and age. But maybe, maybe you're right. You know, maybe both has never experienced. Both is a both is loved. You know? Yeah. So probably <laughs> from his point of view, he probably doesn't understand it. But I mean, living in this country, growing up, Russia, all of these countries, England, you, yeah, especially with football, all these monkey chants and. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all of these European countries, a lot of them have immigrants playing for them that come from Africa and all over the world. And they're quick to use you, but then again, when you fail, they throw you under the bus. Because they're saying all black players miss penalties. I mean, <laughs> that is and yeah. it is something bigger than sports. Yeah. For you to actually yeah. think that and put a blame on you missing a penalty because the color of his skin i mean they're just looking at excuses and it is sad that in this day and age that is still going on i mean why would you want them to play for the country anyway if they score That's a really them good on. question yeah if it and was up to me the athletes themselves the, the players would like, for why would they country? want to play for a country yeah. like that um that's that's really tough as well yeah, the perks, um, even the though perks the earning opportunity is good um yeah. is it worth it otherwise it just the money. So I mean, you're playing for Jamaica versus you're playing for England. Where you get all those pounds? <laughs> I would probably play for England. I probably just bite my lip, yeah. go out here and play for England, and then I win for England. You can, you can I, ignore it. I probably have my Jamaica flag, you know, in my pocket somewhere. And then yeah, I, I I tell you something. You see, these players. It's because they, they're making so much money now. Mm -hmm. they start to speak up more now. Yeah. Like back then, they would have just played deaf to the whole situation. But because you find that they're a lot more, they have more power now. Yeah. So everybody, so you find that you you hear more about this racism and all that's been yeah, going but, on from yeah, from it's still Gilbert, going on from from long time. Yeah, in all these countries, Serbia, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Russia. But what the voice now? They have a voice now. You know, they, they have power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they so you, you will hear more about it now. And the, before the matches, they have this where the knee and black lives matter and all these things but really and truly it is getting better because it's out there in the public but still a far way to go to erase racism which to me is the journey is long but we're on the right part because as i said they said we have the medium where it has been put out that it's not acceptable and you have fans being banned from stadiums banned from watching matches and Stuff like but, that. But, but football have a, have a far way to go. You know, like the NBA, the NBA cannot put a stop to it. Mm. The, in, in, but um, foot, soccer, I should mm. say, have a long way to go in, in that regard. But to me, this racism thing is bigger than sports. It's, yeah, it is. It, it is. is something within an individual to find a fault of your performance of being the color oh, of your skin, skin, which to me is, I can't even fathom it. But yeah, that's another hot take. Another hot take: lawn tennis. The Wimbledon final. Wimbledon, Djokovic winning. No number twenty, tied with. Where put Djokovic now? Number twenty with with Nadal and Federer having twenty. Grand Joker, uh, at the end of it, Djokovic will will go down as the greatest tennis player. I will wait till all their careers are over. But another hot yeah. take: I've been thinking about it. This goat topic, it's been thrown around a lot. I mean, debates. Everybody's are, a goat now, eh? Everybody <laughs> is a goat. And greatest of all time, the yeah. time goat. Yeah. But to me, 
<laughs> debates were made to be have. Yes. And you have to have your own personal... But based on the stats, do you know? Take, uh, that's what comes down to that. Yeah, stats. Based on stats. To me, my point on the goat is not only necessary stats. All right, what because is when you look at it... Wins and losses? You can't just look at stats. Okay. And mm. it's hard to compare cross eras because... You're faced with different things, but you only can play who's in front of you. Yeah, so, so it, that's why people tend to all right, so go Pete, towards Pete, that. All right, so Pete, who back back then, Pete probably back. Pete had four grand, fourteen grand. Fourteen, stands. but right. I'm even looking at it wider all across okay. sports. Okay. To me, Messi is the greatest thing I've ever seen played football, and he's just won his first international title. Yeah. So, yeah, what does that say? You cannot tell me you have seen oh. somebody in recent times better than Messi. So to me. What makes you the goat or mm. puts you in that category is not only stats, but also how you transcend the sport. Yeah. Because for one, Muhammad Ali is touted as the greatest boxer, mm -hmm. but even so, the greatest athlete across all sports. And mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali record is not the best. So, so that's why you dis disregard stats because your choice is messy. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I'm sure it, I'm, that doesn't support Messi being the like best. It, it supports it, but I'm saying it's not all. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player. He doesn't have the best all stats. Right. I no, mean, no straight from the Joker for a minute. Yeah. That's I'm going back to the Joker. Hold on, let's Joker let's, is going to have the stats, but to on. me, what Roger Federer did for the sport at tennis and transcend it to a level where it's at now. Somebody will pass Tiger Woods, but yeah. for you to put that sport and elevate that sport, yeah, to a uh, Live where it's so, so you thought that Federer Federer is the greatest, uh, Nadal is my player. Elevated um lawn tennis to another level more than Andre and, and, and Pete. No, they did it, that's why they oh. were. But when oh. you come after, you have to outdo the person. Right, let me give some stats. Let me go with the stats. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, the stats. Joker is the only lawn tennis player to win four, four grand slam two, two times in a row. No other player, two times, two, two times, times. Yeah. Four, four, four grand slam, yeah, two mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. Right, he the head to head matchup with him and Federer, he's still he's leading Federer and he's leading and he's Nadal, leading, and he's leading, mm -hmm. leading Nadal. Yeah, so if Federer is the how can Federer be the greatest? Because this man has accomplished something that no other long tennis player has, has ever done before, but and still young and still going. No, he's not young, he's the same age as, as most of them. He had Nadal is about the same age. No, he started late. No, then no, he's young. He's young in the sport. Hey. He's young. He's young. He started late. So what about that part of his career where he was absent? You have to look at it at totality. No, but all right. Over the past decade, nah. he has 18 grand slams. No, wins. I'm saying at the end of the day when you tally it up. Come by, come by. Federer and, 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 and Nadal together. They only have 15 in In the last 10 years? Yes. So what about the 10 years before that? What 10 years before that? So when when was Federer winning? Federer started winning in about 03, 02. Yes, yeah, so what about that period? Where was Djokovic? I'm sure he was alive. He's a late starter. Precisely, he's a late starter. But, but look at the accomplishments. No, he's catching up. Catching up? Oh, he's, come he's on. right there. Oh, Djokovic is right there. <laughs> I mean, but and even so Daniel, Daniel, what 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 you saying over there? What are you well, saying? I'm just saying me. I'm, tell I'm me. actually learning. <laughs> Learning and land tennis, land tennis <laughs> is played. It's harder to determine land tennis because it's played on different basically surfaces. four different surfaces. Yes, but he's dominant and, and dominant no, he's on not, all four. No, the most dominant on any one surface is Rafael Nadal. One surface. Yeah. And it's, the second... In totality. And, 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 and average, second, on, average. On grass, the most dominant player on grass yeah. is Roger Federer. Okay, okay. That's the most dominant on a hard court is Djokovic. Okay. The okay. most all round and all... It's I would give Djokovic Federer. He's the only one that won four slams. I mean, him just win French Open now that they beat Nadal in a close French final. Him, if, he's Nadal in him prime. He couldn't beat Nadal in prime. <laughs> Nadal, Nadal has a prime. No, Nadal is weak, man. I mean, Nadal, Nadal is my player, and I think Nadal is number three right now. Nadal. Djokovic pass out Nadal right now. So my biasness, <laughs> I throw it out with about what Federer do for the sport, all right, not so only right. on the court and off the court. I mean, yeah, all right, that, that is true. Federer, Federer make, Fe Fe people flood the gates and go watch Wimbledon, watch all these, turn I, on the TV to watch I, Federer, I, Nadal classic. I turn on my TV to watch Serena. <laughs> well, <laughs> probably for different reasons. You know, you know that, yes, something in 2002. <laughs> probably just like when you watch the... 
it's not. He's probably oh, watching oh, yeah. okay. so I don't know if it's that. No, but let's, let's put it. Let's put it though. The, he's even with. He's he's, he's even right now. He's on twenty right across yeah. the board. Yeah, Federer twenty, mm-hmm. Nadal with twenty, the Joker with twenty. So mm-hmm. he's going for the golden slam. Yeah, winning. So the next thing will be um the Olympics. Olympics. Yeah. So if he yeah. wins the Olympics. That yeah. it's hard to debate so against that again. He has to win the Olympics yeah. and then move on to the US Open, mm-hmm. and then after that, then then we will decide. I'm saying when everybody's career is over, we'll have this debate again. So, but that to me, Federer is still the greatest at this point in time. I might change my view later on, uh, but the, for to be the goat, it can't just be stats alone because. Michael Jordan didn't have the greatest stats. Muhammad Ali didn't have yeah. the greatest stats. Impact Messi and, doesn't have the greatest stats. Impact. And all these players yeah, are true. in the debate. Impact and winning. Why? Impact and winning. All right. And value to winning. Uh, so, but you can't put stats on that. Mm-hmm. So what is the value on him winning? Well, then? well that's why I Who can't. Who you beating? That's why I can't rate Messi. But anyway, Daniel, I wanted to ask you something. Um, you used to watch Jolette? Was she a, a runner that you used to watch? You, you grew up watching her? Um... I don't remember Juliet, but she mentioned that my coach, Michelle, Michelle Freeman, we actually share the same birthday. Um, she was my Michelle, coach. Michelle, was, Free, Michelle Freeman was your coach? Yes, she was the one who coached me the year that I ran my fastest in the 400 hurdles. So okay, she was huh. working at the University of Texas. And so I, all I have from Michelle are just some stories. And I've been lucky to be around her and Dianne Hemmings, who, you know, is the first woman to win a gold medal for Jamaica at the Olympics. Um, that, in was the 96. Yes. that was 96. That yeah, was 96. Yeah. But I grew up watching Bridget Foster, yeah. um, Lastina, Delarine, um, Navlin and Sharika Williams, and, oh, what's her name again? Um, Brooks, Sherry and Brooks and those <laughs> ladies. Um, but I do remember watching Bridget Foster before the Hilton was added on. That's how yeah. early I used to watch her. And I knew from when I saw her on that race, I think it was a Commonwealth Games, I'm not sure, um, that I was fascinated with the hurdles from then. Okay. And I knew I wanted to be an athlete, and I hadn't even started track yet. So yeah. that was where the desire um, started, or the interest started for me. Okay, yeah, Bridget, Bridget was a good herd learner. She had a lot of mishaps, though, you know? But she, she stuck yeah, with it. But she stuck with and it. She, when she won late on in her career, that yeah. was... She won very yeah, late. She, very late. She was yeah. what, 35 or 34 yeah. when she yeah. won? Yeah, she been through a lot, and she keep on improving, keep on improving. And then when she won that gold medal, because, I mean, I used to go to UTEC, and I always see them train up there. And to me, she's the most committed Chuck and feel it I've ever seen. Well, let me brag because Bridget, when don't. I went to UTEC, <laughs> when I went to UTEC, um, my first year, they were like, you know, you knew, so they want to see if you can hang, kind of training hard. And, you know, after a week, they're like calling me traps. They're like, oh, that used to be Bridget's name because she used yeah. to do everything. So, she you know, I come in it. and I was yeah. training so hard. Mm. And um, so discipline, they're like, yeah, you're you're the next tracks. Yeah. <laughs> so Bridget, don't miss training. Trust me, as she, she committed. She, she don't ease her. Always there, always there. Sun up, sun down. She I think she, she was one of the first um with MVP. I think she started it with um with Fana, right? She was, yeah, one, she of was one of the first athletes, if yeah. not the first, the matriarch of the club. Yeah, yeah. So definitely. And um, you know, I also worked with her a little bit at MVP as well. She um, is heavy in the hurdling. Um, yeah. Oh, she's still there. coaching. She's still coaching. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's good. It's been a while since I've been up to Utah. I should go up here. So, I mean, yeah, so you, you 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 won't catch her now, but maybe yeah. in the off season yeah. you will. Yeah. Utah is my place, man. Utah is. But well, tonight, tonight we get we have one more thing. Um, the NBA yeah, finals before tonight. wrap up. Um, for the weekend. Yeah. What well, the finals tonight is two game five. NBA Finals yeah, 2-2. Phoenix going a 2-0 lead. I mean... Phoenix Suns. If they can Chris rebound Paul, now... Chris Paul kind of choke up the last match to, you know. I mean, come with the all, come with the man. Yeah. It's time now. What is his time doing? You know? I, I think Box will win eventually. I think Boxing... Boxing 6? I mean, they Boxing put them to win six. tonight. Boxing 6. Boxing 6. 
Mm-hmm. So wrapping up, my next week we have an NBA champion. I think we have some pro tour events to check and feel coming up this week. And Olympics check and feel start July the 29th. Olympics kick off July 21st. Yes. Check and feel starts July 29th. So in wrapping up, hot week coming up again. We'll be here next week. Saturdays, one to two. We're working on that time period to go three hours to talk sports all day. But for now, Prime Sports Center. Me and my co-host, Dale Parham, Daniel right. Gowie. Thanks. See you again next week. All right. Yes. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. One love. Thank you. All right.